Hello and welcome to Archaeology from the Sky. I'm Chris Fisher and, and I'm Steve Lees. And we're going to kind of do this talk together, so we're going to jump back and forth. Um, and to begin, let's see if we can get this to advance. I'd like to thank sort of the, the unsung heroes of this project and the, and the people that have really made a lot of a lot of this work possible, and that's a dedicated team of graduate students from the United States, uh, Mexico, Europe, and South America, uh, many, whom, many of whom you can see uh, here. I want to take this opportunity and, and start this talk by discussing just really briefly why we do archaeology and why archaeology is important. Even though archaeology is a discipline that's rooted in the past, our goal is to provide a, to build a better society, to provide a better future. We can use lessons from the past, both success stories and failure stories, uh, at, as clues for stakeholders and policymakers uh, today and in the future. And in that sense, that makes archaeology a futurist discipline. Archaeology can also help us with preservation and um, uh, socio-ecological diversity. Uh, it can tell us what's there, it can tell us how past peoples manipulated landscapes, and it can provide clues uh, toward how we can develop these uh, past landscapes for modern conservation. And in that sense, archaeology really is a tool for modern policy policymakers and stakeholders. Our, the long durée, our long prehistory, our long relationship with human societies and these environments that they largely construct for human goals is the ultimate sandbox for policymakers and stakeholders. And finally, archaeology is important as patrimony and we can help uh, not only discover but also figure out how to conserve this archaeological patrimony. In that sense, archaeology really then is a critical discipline for uh, building a better future and to help us address the kinds of problems that we're going to face in the next coming decades. I also want to take a minute to just quickly illustrate some broad lessons that Steve and I have learned from this program of research. Uh, and, and these lessons apply the, really beyond the sort of the halls of acad academia. I think these are broad lessons that people could perhaps use anywhere. Um, but but it's but they're things that we have especially learned from this project. So, first of all, question assumptions. We need to constantly question the assumptions that guide our research. And if we don't do that, the research will stagnate. And one example of that are these cities that 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 we in one case discovered and in another case helped discover. If you don't look for these cities, if the assumptions that are guiding your research would suggest that cities aren't there and you never look for them, you'll never find them. And the second is take risks. And the best science is risky science. And we have to innovate. We have to get outside of our comfort zone. And, and if we don't do that, the discipline will not uh, advance. The problem with that, of course, is that risky science is hard to fund. And that's one other lesson that we can take away from the, the, the research that we're going to talk about today, and that is that we have to seek alternative sources of funding to do this kind of research. The next thing is this idea of big data, and especially with LIDAR, we are in the era of big data. For the first time, archaeologists have data sets that they've only sort of dreamed about. We'll be able to address questions that have been unreachable up to this point, but only if we can harness the, the technology needed to use these big data. And that is a, that's something that we're grappling with in the projects that are described in this talk. How do, we, how do we analyze, how do we compile, etc.? How do we even store the data that we're collecting? And then finally, the final lesson is that the best questions, 
The most important questions are multidisciplinary questions. And this project is a great example of the synergies that are possible when you incorporate people from multiple disciplines. And I would argue that in the future, all research is going to have to be multidisciplinary to some extent. Today I'm going to talk about, Steve and I are going to talk about two broad case studies. And these are case studies that specifically have used LIDAR, or LIDAR has transformed, uh, significantly shaped the arc of these projects. In the first is, um, I'm going to, we're going to talk briefly about Angamuco, uh, this newly discovered Purepecha city uh, in western Mexico where LIDAR was used to augment what I would consider to be fairly traditional survey, although survey with some sophisticated GPS and other equipment. And then the second is a project that Steve and I have been involved in uh, on using LIDAR sort of in, in contrast to this idea of using LIDAR to expand our knowledge of an existing place. Here we've used LIDAR on sort of a voyage of discovery and surveying the unknown for cultural remains, cultural landscapes um, that can then be used for conservation. And this project, of course, has taken place in the Mesquitia Coast area um, of, of Honduras. And so, we'll turn it over to Steve. Now what I'd like to do is go into the past and how archaeologists show how archaeologists have made use of new technologies for a very long time. I'm not an archaeologist, I'm a geographer. My work for the past 20 years has focused on the use of remote sensing, data, air photos, satellite imagery, and spatial databases to try to understand how land use and land cover is changing. Very similar to what Chris is doing, but I look at it today mainly, he looks at it in the past. So we've come together to, on this project, to apply some of the things that I've been working with, remote sense data, to archaeology. And that's where the LIDAR comes in. Hello and welcome to Archaeology from the Sky. I'm Chris Fisher. And, and I'm Steve Lees. And we're going to kind of do this talk together, so we're going to jump back and forth. Um, and to begin, let's see if we can get this to advance. I'd like to thank sort of the, the unsung heroes of this project and the, and the people that have really made a lot of a, a lot of this work possible, and that's a dedicated team of graduate students from the United States, uh, Mexico, Europe, and South America. Uh, many who, many of whom you can see uh, here. I want to take this opportunity and, and start this talk by discussing just really briefly why we do archaeology and why archaeology is important. Even though archaeology is a discipline that's rooted in the past, our goal is to provide a, to build a better society, to provide a better future. We can use lessons from the past, both success stories and failure stories, uh, at, as clues for stakeholders and policymakers uh, today and in the future. And in that sense, that makes archaeology a futurist discipline. Archaeology can also help us with preservation and um, uh, socio-ecological diversity. Uh, it can tell us what's there, it can tell us how past peoples manipulated landscapes, and it can provide clues uh, toward how we can develop these uh, past landscapes for modern conservation. And in that sense, archaeology really is a tool for modern policy policymakers and stakeholders. Our, the long durée, our long prehistory, our long relationship with human societies and these environments that they largely construct for human goals is the ultimate sandbox for policymakers and stakeholders. And finally, archaeology is important as patrimony and we can help uh, not only discover but also figure out how to conserve this archaeological patrimony. In that sense, archaeology really then is a critical discipline for uh, building a better future and to help us address the kinds of problems that we're going to face in the next coming decades. I also want to take a minute to just quickly 
illustrate some broad lessons that Steve and I have learned from this program of research. Uh, and, and these lessons apply the, really beyond the sort of the halls of acad academia. I think these are broad lessons that people could perhaps use anywhere. Um, but, but, it's, but they're things that we have especially learned from this project. So, first of all, question assumptions. We need to constantly question the assumptions that guide our research. And if we don't do that, the research will stagnate. And one example of that are these cities that, that, that we've in one case discovered and in another case helped discover. If you don't look for these cities, if the assumptions that are guiding your research would suggest that cities aren't there and you never look for them, you'll never find them. And the second is take risks. And the best science is risky science. And we have to innovate. We have to get outside of our comfort zone. And, and if we don't do that, the discipline will not uh, advance. The problem with that, of course, is that risky science is hard to fund. And that's one other lesson that we can take away from the, the, the research that we're going to talk about today. And that is that we have to seek alternative sources of funding to do this kind of research. The next thing is this idea of big data, and especially with LIDAR, we are in the era of big data. For the first time, archaeologists have data sets that they've only sort of dreamed about. We'll be able to address questions that have been unreachable up to this point, but only if we can harness the, the technology needed to use these big data. And that is a, that's something that we're grappling with in the projects that are described in this talk. How do we, how do we analyze, how do we compile, et cetera? How do we even store the data that we're collecting? And then finally, the final lesson is that the best questions, the most important questions, are multidisciplinary questions. And this project is a great example of the synergies that are possible when you incorporate people from multiple disciplines. And I would argue that in the future, all research is going to have to be multidisciplinary to some extent. Today I'm going to talk about, Steve and I are going to talk about two broad case studies. And these are case studies that specifically have used LIDAR, or LIDAR has transformed, uh, significantly shaped the arc of these projects. In the first is, um, I'm going to, we're going to talk briefly about Angamuco, uh, this newly discovered Purépecha city uh, in western Mexico where LIDAR was used to augment what I would consider to be fairly traditional survey, although survey with some sophisticated GPS and other equipment. And then the second is a project that Steve and I have been involved in uh, on using LIDAR sort of in, in contrast to this idea of using LIDAR to expand our knowledge of an existing place. Here we've used LIDAR on sort of a voyage of discovery and surveying the unknown for cultural remains, cultural landscapes um, that can then be used for conservation. And this project, of course, has taken place in the Mesquitia Coast area um, of, of Honduras. And so we'll turn it over to Steve. Now what I'd like to do is go into the past and how archaeologists show how archaeologists have made use of new technologies for a very long time. I'm not an archaeologist, I'm a geographer. My work for the past 20 years has focused on the use of remote sensing, data, air photos, satellite imagery, and spatial databases to try to understand how land use and land cover is changing. Very similar to what Chris is doing, but I look at it today mainly, he looks at it in the past. So we've come together to, on this project, to apply some of the things that I've been working with, remote sense data, to archaeology. And that's where the LIDAR comes in. The use of remote sensing data by archaeologists is not necessarily new. In fact, if you go to the very first air photos, some of the very first air photos taken, archaeologists made use of them. But at that time, taking air photos from the sky was too expensive for it to be used exclusively for air photos, much as getting LIDAR from the sky today is breaks our budget if we try to do it in most in many cases. 
So what you find is you find the first, some of the first applications of air photos to archaeology were coming from air photos that were taken for military purposes. And in that case, World War I, or in that sense, World War I was a watershed for that. The British armed forces were interested in the Middle East. They were fighting the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East. They sent out planes with area, with area photography equipment specifically to take photos for mapping purposes. As after the war, as they started to go through those photos, they found things like this. The lost city of Samara, which was known to have been somewhere in the area, but they had never found it. They found it in air photos. <clears throat> World War II, between the wars, there was more delving into the catalog of air photos that were taken during World War I, and there were some attempts at using air photos or aerial surveys specifically for archaeology. In fact, Lindbergh was taken down by a Yale survey, if I remember correctly, to go to some of the areas maybe where we're working the Mesquitia. They know they flew over those areas, but they couldn't see beneath the canopy. All they could see were the large monumental architecture popping out of the canopy. World War II brought another watershed moment. In this case, you had not just the Royal Air Force, but you had the U.S. Air Force basically flying in places in the world that had never been flown before and taking air photos for mapping purposes, for reconnaissance purposes. Post-World War II, those were used, again by archaeologists, to identify potential sites and even to map sites, such as this one taken by Williams Hunt um, of Angkor. They knew Angkor was there. It had been discovered, rediscovered by the French, but they didn't know how extensive it was. This started to get an idea of how extensive it was. Another thing that came out of World War II, out of the military applications, was radar. Radar could actually see beneath the tree canopy in some cases. And archaeologists started to look at that for use in identifying potential sites. <clears throat> then came space photography. In the late 1950s, we put satellites into space. Starting in 1959, actually, the Corona Spy Satellite Program started by the United States. So in the 1960s, we started to get photos from space down where you could see things on the ground that were about nine feet. However, we didn't know those were up there or that those were usable. Most archaeologists couldn't get them until President Clinton released this data in the late 1990s. And then archaeologists started to use it to map things on the ground that had been there in the 60s but may not be there today. The... <clears throat> what? I missed... Oh. Fa... Sorry. <laughs> Following on the Corona program in the 1970s, the Landsat program started. This was a civilian, civilian satellite program, mainly for seeing, for making use of the, the imagery to identify natural resources and map natural resources on, on the ground, but also archaeologists could make use of it in some cases, especially in conjunction with space-borne radar. And this was used in open areas such as the Sahara Desert where they found they could identify old riverbeds. They could identify places where old tracks were. And it was used to, to identify potential sites of lost cities. In the late 1990s, higher resolution satellite was introduced, information was introduced in the form of private satellites going up. And that's been used to great extent by archaeologists more recently to map archaeological sites, known sites and potential sites. But again, you can't see below the, set, below the canopy. <clears throat> There's higher resolution public satellites available, such as ALOS. We're using this on the um, Legacies of Resilience project in, West, in the uh, Angamuco area, identifying terraces on hillsides and being able to map the extent of terraces, ancient terraces in the area. And uh, some of this is actually funded by NASA, which is interested in trying to get more use of the civilian satellite program, the archive satellite information, by many different disciplines, including archaeology. And that's what brought Chris and I originally together, was a proposal that we wrote to the space archaeology program and got funding to make use of some of the higher resolution imagery to identify where those terraces are, how the land how the landscape was used within the Parepecha Patsquara area. Archaeologists have moved into a news phase with remote, remotely sensed data. 
making use of a newer technology, which also is expensive, which we can't always fund out of our own pockets, but is incredibly useful for archaeologists, for archaeological discovery and archaeological research. LIDAR, light detection and ranging. Now this is, it's a new technology for us, especially the airborne type, but it's really not all that new. LIDAR came out in the 1960s. Basically, it's sending out a light wave, bouncing it off of an object, and recording the time it takes for the light wave to go back, bounce off, and come back to you. So you know the distance it is. If you take a lot of those readings, you get a point cloud, which gives you a near 3D representation of what you're looking at. You can make a 3D model out of it. It's getting really close to putting into virtual reality, as Chris will talk about in a little bit. <clears throat> You can think of it as a laser rangefinder that you use if you're a hunter and going out and trying to figure out how far away the deer is you're trying to shoot, or if you're a golfer going out trying to figure out how far away the flag is that you're trying to get close to. That's basically the technology. The first application I want to talk about is terrestrial LIDAR. This is what a terrestrial LIDAR piece looks like. <clears throat> terrestrial LIDAR is used by engineers to, to figure out what's out there as they're putting in new, new buildings or new infrastructure. It can also be used to figure out what a hillside looks like. It's used by police. It's better than a radar gun. It's more accurate. Holds up in court better so they can get, get you with speeding easier. It's used by foresters to figure out how tall that tree is, what's beneath the tree, what the volume of timber is out there. And it's used by archaeologists you can set a terrestrial LIDAR unit down inside of a monument or outside and measure it totally and get that 3D representation, that 3D model of that monument. And that can, that's a near permanent record. So even if the monument's destroyed, you still have that information. This is Rosalind Chapel in England. And this one, you all know what it is. And there are groups out there who are doing this type of monument measuring to get permanent or near permanent records of these important pieces of our history. SciArc is one of them, which Chris will mention a little bit in his talk, <clears throat> and there's others. However, there's another way of doing LiDAR, which is what we're interested in, and that's taking it from the air. You put a LiDAR instrument in a plane looking down, or a helicopter, a GPS unit so you know exactly where you're get to, getting that reading, an inertial measurement unit so you know exactly what your orientation is, and then you shoot a lot of LiDAR straight down. Some of it gets bounced off the canopy, some of it gets recorded within the canopy, bounces off from within that area, some of it makes it all the way to the ground. So you can see beneath the tree cover. You can actually map out what's on the ground. And that's where it gets really interesting. Because then, <clears throat> what you're able to do is see below that, see what the foundations are beneath there. That's the type of thing that we've been able to do at Agamuco, and they're doing it with the Mosquitia. It's not an image, it's a point cloud. You've got to visualize the data in different ways. So it's not an image, there's your point cloud, you can visualize it as an elevation model. You can make it into a 3D rendering. You can look at it and spin it around and see it in different ways. It also is not going to degrade like a photograph. It's going to be there for a while, as long as no one runs a magnet over it. <clears throat> and we're moving to the point, to the situation where we can actually visualize this in new ways. So far I've talked about two-dimensional representations of it, maybe a near 3D on the screen, but it's somewhere like the Keck, Keck Caves at UC Davis. They're experimenting with putting the point cloud out there so you can walk through it. And who knows, maybe someday we will we'll be in a Star Trek situation where we put it out there, we put some of those 2D renderings over in 3D, and all of a sudden we're walking through a hollow deck. So what does LiDAR represent for archaeology, or specifically, as we're talking about today, the archaeology of Mesoamerica, or more broadly, the Americas? Um, and let me, let me just preface this by saying that in Europe, archaeologists have been using LiDAR for a while. And uh, they have fine-tuned many of the techniques that, that we use when we analyze our light, LiDAR data from the Americas. But the situation for the Americas is fundamentally different. In Europe, LiDAR was primarily used to augment 
knowledge of known sites or landscapes. In the Americas, our LIDAR is starting to be used on what we've termed voyages of discovery, documenting new landscapes and new settlements that we didn't know were there. And for that reason, in, especially in the Americas, LIDAR represents what we've, said, what we've, what we've stated is a, a scientific revolution or a paradigm shift. And let me explain what some of the elements of that paradigm shift might look like. So, archaeolo we're, we're, as archaeologists, we're, we're fighting a battle that we're, we're not equipped to fight it, we're not ill-equipped to fight it, we're simply not equipped to fight it. And it's a battle that we can't win. We're losing sites to looting, uh, urbanization, uh, increasing land use, deforestation, etc. And now, also, global warming. LIDAR, in this sense, is the ultimate preservation tool because we can record not only the site, these sites that we're losing, but these landscapes in incredible detail, have very high resolutions. And as we obtain more LIDAR data, the, 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 these data will represent probably the only records that we have of these landscapes and these settlements. And in that sense, LIDAR represents the ultimate conservation tool. It is our hope that as our techniques become more sophisticated over the coming decades, our, our ways of analyzing and thinking about these data, that people maybe 20 years from now, 30 years from now, will be going through our LIDAR data and reanalyzing and looking at these sites for things that we, we hadn't even really even thought about or, con or, or conceived of. So in that sense, LIDAR can do a lot of things that um, we sort of traditionally have done with archaeology, but with really limited data sets. I mean, for us to perform full coverage survey for an entire river valley, for example, that's a career's worth of work. That's a lifetime worth of work. And then, as, as, you're, as you'll see in this, in this talk, you can obtain LIDAR data for that same area at incredibly high resolution and probably, frankly, uh, a more complete survey record in maybe a couple days. So in that sense, LIDAR will allow us to do some things that we've always done. So help determine the scale, spatial organization of settlements, population estimates, but at a geographic scale that's, that's way beyond what we've thought about before. Level of social complexity, patterns through time, uh, different networks, all these things that we sort of do automatically, degree of environmental modification. But probably LIDAR will allow us to do some other things as well. For the first time, we will be able to experience and document, we'll be able to document landscapes in the same way that we experience them. And that's in multiple dimensions, in three dimensions. We'll be able to move through these sites, walk through these landscapes, investigate them at many different scales. And our thinking is that this will change the kinds of questions and the way that we address data uh, in, in a manner that, that we're only sort of starting to figure out now, I think. In that sense, LIDAR will allow us to repopulate the Americas. I think that the, the scale, the social organization, the degree of environmental manipulation that, that we sort of think of now will be completely changed and our view of the Americas will be completely changed and it will move more toward this idea of the Americas as a managed garden in the centuries leading up to the period uh, of contact. And that alone is a, is a fundamental transition and a fundamental finding that will come out of this LIDAR data. Um, one other thing I want to mention, and something that's come up quite a bit, is this idea of a lost city. And this really also, in the last couple of years, people have really been captivated by this idea of a lost city. And this is actually from a popular blog called Gizmodo, which only nerds like me, I guess, go to. But they have this graphic, and it's a regular feature, and, and they just start plugging data in or plugging news stories in about lost cities that are discovered. And increasingly, they're all discovered through LIDAR. It's all LIDAR. So what is a lost city? Uh, and it's something that's been applied to our stuff time and time again by the media. Um, generally, it's just an urban place that was an aban abandoned. Um, most often, in the, the common way that it's referenced, it's a place that's been forgotten. A place that, they, that people didn't really know were there, or maybe only knew that was there through myth or legend. But it also can apply to, to places like ghost towns. 
places where people knew there was stuff, but they didn't know the extent of it, how big it was, et cetera. An example of that is Anchor Watt, where LiDAR was just, just flown and, and just released, actually, in, in PNAS recently. Um, traditional archaeological techniques can no longer keep up with the pace of discovery and loss, which I've talked about. Additionally, LIDAR is being used not only by archaeologists, not only by scientists, but it's being used for oil and gas exploration, for mineral exploration, and by the military. These records are out there, and if, our, if we as archaeologists don't take charge of this, I mean, let's face it, a geologist is able to recognize a big pyramid as well as we can. It's fairly obvious. These sites are going to be lost, they're going to be looted, they're going to be destroyed, or they're not going to tell us about them and they're going to be destroyed. So we really need to harness, harness this, these technologies. Um, so let me talk about one of the case studies that we're going to talk about today. And again, this is the case study of Angamuco. Uh, and it's, 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 a, it, it's the research that, that really initially drove us to LIDAR, I guess. And this is an example of a place that, in terms of the lost city example, a place that we knew was there, but we didn't know how big it was. We didn't know how extensive it was. We didn't really know what was there. And it was practically impossible to figure that out. So let me give you some background about that. At the time of European contact, central Mexico was dominated by two empires. The one you've heard about, and that's the Aztec or Triple Alliance Empire. And the second one, maybe you've heard about, or maybe you've had a class from me or something, or, and that's the Purépecha Empire, okay? But many people have not heard about it. The Aztecs controlled much of eastern Mexico, and the Purépecha controlled much of western Mexico. Uh, it was an empire that roughly was very similar to um, the Aztec Empire. Uh, it controlled much of western Mexico, mostly the, the, the borders of the modern state of Michoacán, which is uh, fairly huge. Uh, it's located 360 kilometers northwest of Mexico City. It's roughly similar to the basin of Mexico in terms of general topology, um, uh, vegetation, plants, etc. The, the main difference is that unlike the basin of Mexico, which is completely covered by modern Mexico City, the Lake Pátzcuaro Basin, which is the core of that Parapacha Empire, is largely rural. So it's mostly farm fields and, and, uh, and small villages. Meaning that here, you can go out and you can see where the emperor's palace was. You can go to the imperial capital. You can't really do that very readily in, in Mexico City anymore. Uh, through long-term NSF-sponsored survey in the eastern part of that Lake Pátzcuaro Basin, uh, between 2008 and um, 2010, uh, myself and a team of, of excellent graduate students uh, surveyed about 25 square kilometers, 30 square kilometers actually, and discovered about 25 settlements. Most of them were fairly small. Most of them were what we normally would have expected. One of them was not. And one of them turned out to be the ancient city of Angamuco, which we discovered in 2009. And actually when we discovered it, we didn't realize how big it was, we didn't realize how extensive it was, we didn't even really realize that it was a city. We just understood that it was a very large site. Uh, and in, in 2009, a bunch of the graduate students actually convinced me that we needed to find an edge before we could sort of continue and figure out and strategize and plan for the survey of this thing. Angamuco occupies a rugged landform. It's called a Malpais. It's a very recent lava flow. Uh, it's not suitable for modern agriculture. And as a result, that has served to preserve thousands of architectural foundations, which we'll talk about in a minute. I walked across this feature, this Mal Pais. Um, it took me about an hour and a half, I guess. Uh, if you were actually just walking across this normally, it might take you about a, a half hour. It took me an hour and a half because I kept seeing things and stopping and looking at stuff. So I kind of meandered across here and I got to the other side and I was like, oh, I'm on the other side. And then I was like, oh, I didn't get an edge. It covers the entire feature. And um, I got back, and I think some of the graduate students were worried about me because I was out of radio contact. They thought I had a fall or something. And I, I think I looked a little pale. And they said, what's wrong? And I'm like, I think we just discovered the city. And they were all like, oh, woohoo, Indiana Jones moment. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. This, up the, this ups the ante. 
the ups the ante in terms of permits, in terms of reporting. And most importantly, it ups the ante in terms of people that have a long-term investment in the archaeology of this region. Because according to the ethno-history, according to this archaeological logic that has dominated investigation in this region for decades, this can't be a city. It's not supposed to be here, which is why nobody looked. And since we actually looked, we found it. And um, that opened us up to a significant amount of criticism, some of which is still happening today. And that's one of the another theme we'll talk about in this talk, is this, if you question assumptions, you look for things that aren't supposed to be there and you find them, you're going to get slammed. You need to be ready for that. Um, anyway, so Agamuka, this new, newly discovered lost city. Uh, thousands of architectural uh, foundations are preserved on Agamuka, including pyramids, which occur several nodes of monumental architecture. I'm mostly going to talk about one node. Thousands of granaries, thousands of house foundations, roads, um, public buildings, plazas. There are at least three giant reservoirs around the sides of the site. There are probably reservoirs other parts of the site. There are ball courts. You name it, it's up there. None of this stuff is supposed to be there, by the way. Um, in two years of survey, we covered about two kilometers, two square kilometers, and documented over 2,500 architectural features. At this period of time, I thought the site covered maybe about eight square kilometers. And that was pushing it. And I was really getting a lot of criticism for people for thinking that there was a site that was this large. It dates predominantly to this period between AD 1000 and AD 1350 which is also a period of time that predates the empire. So I was also getting a lot of criticism for that. It wasn't supposed to be a big city that predated the empire. What we realized very quickly was that our method of survey, which was documenting every building that we encountered in, with sub-meter accuracy using some pretty sophisticated GPS equipment, was too slow. I'm not a very patient person, and I didn't want to spend the rest of my career surveying this landform, which is what it would have taken. And at that point, I started to enter into discussions with Steve um, about how we can actually accelerate this process a little bit. And so one day after Chris came back from his survey, that was summer 2010, yeah. knocks on my door because we'd been working together on the Space Archaeology Grant looking at the whole basin and said, is there anything from space that we can get that we could use to map this out? I said, well, high resolution imagery. He said, no, it's got to see below canopy. I'd never worked with LIDAR, but I'd read about it. And I had some colleagues who had told me about it, really high. And I said, well, we could look at LIDAR. And so we talked about what LIDAR was and what it might be able to see. And the Chases had just published an article on it. And we did a lit search and came up with some other examples of how it had been used in small areas just to identify one or two features. And we thought, let's go for it. So we found that Merrick, right down in Aurora, they have an office in Mexico City, and they had a lot, they fly LIDAR. Called them up, and they gave us a, an astronomical price for doing, originally we asked for like 13 square kilometers, then we asked for 9 square kilometers, really high price. What, what's a high price? I'm just $120,000. Yeah, actually a little bit more than that. But more than half of Typical, more than half of a typical NSF award. Right. As much as we had got for the whole space archaeology award, basically. So that wasn't going to fly. Then in December, they call us and say, hey, we've got a project in Mexico. We can tag yours on at the end of it, and it'll cost a lot less. Chris and I talked about it, and Chris is like, uh, that's all, that's, that was just about everything you had left in your NSF, right? It was pretty close, so, and I'll tell you what that is, I mean, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, for me, a field season costs about $30,000, with cars and everything, and paying the permit fees and all that sort of stuff, um, which reminds me of Florence, we need to do that for uh, this year. Uh, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, about $30,000, roughly, uh, overhead to the university, all that sort of stuff. Um, and I think Merrick, what did they charge us? Thirty-five thousand. Yeah, it was about that. So I took a I took a pretty big gamble. I mean, I called the program director at NSF and I said I want to do this, and he said, Is it going to work? And I said, and I lied, and I said, Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so uh, so 
So we came back and we got the data and we looked at it, and I didn't really, at and, that point, didn't. Right, this is what they flew. This is their flight right. plan, and this is the area they were flying, okay? So nine square kilometers right there. And so I didn't really understand what we got back, and I'm like, Steve, this is going to work, right? Steve, this is going to work. It's like, yeah, just don't worry about it. And then we got it back, and I was like, oh my god. Okay, well, I guess we can see some things. Then we started to work with the data and like, uh, learn, talk to some people and learn about how to do it. We went down to Merrick. Yeah, we went down to Merrick. And basically, Merrick's engineers. So they took off and gave us a model of what the area would, lo would look like with nothing on it, including wiping out all the foundations, <laughs> any structures. So I realized what they had done. We refiltered it. We found out how to use their software, refiltered it. And then all of a sudden, things started popping up. And what we got was we got nine square kilometers. You realize in looking at it that the, the city went off of that area. It's probably twice as big for what Chris thinks now. Normally, I'm saying now it's 12 square kilometers. I think it's bigger than that, but now that I've said it's 12 square kilometers, I'm getting even more criticism about it. So once we get lighter for the rest of it, I think it's going to be more than 12. But we'll, we'll see how it goes. Really, really accurate. And we had them fly so that we could basically identify something the size of a basketball on the ground. And the accuracy that they're claiming after they're, they processed it is that it was plus minus 2.5 centimeters, vertical and horizontal. So it's like, it's like identifying a basketball underneath the tree canopy. And it's a three-level tree canopy at plus minus 2.5 centimeters. It significantly changed the arc of the product. Because this is what, this is a derived product. This is not the point cloud. This is taking the very last return, which is from the ground, turning it into an elevation model. So you can see walls. And what's overlaying on that are the results of the GPS surveying from previous summers, from previous field seasons. And you can see the GPS, and that GPS is plus minus 50 centimeters. It's differentially corrected, but the accuracy that it's giving us is plus minus 50 centimeters. So Chris has a little story to tell about his altar right here. Yeah, I can tell that. And then we should. So um, I, one thing. So what, what you're looking at is, so we surveyed this without the lidar, and then we back, went back and laid the survey data directly over the lidar, and you can see there's a, there's a a pretty good correspondence. Um, some of these bumps that you're seeing here are actually one thing that we've had to do, and, and this goes back to this idea of the engineers analyzing the data, is that they want to take all the noise out. And we're like, no, bring on the noise. We need to have the noise. That's, that's the archaeology. So in doing that, we've actually left some vegetation in here. So these are the basic stuff trees, probably. Yeah. Um, but what's interesting is that there's a lot of things that were visible on here, and this was surveyed very well. A lot of things that are visible on here that we can't see in the field, okay? And it's not for want of trying. It's just simply, you just simply can't see them. And then the other thing we realize is that the LiDAR is actually more accurate than the very expensive and fancy GPS units we're using. And when this initially happened, I said, why doesn't this square overlay the altar? Why wasn't this digitized correctly? And I went back and I said, you guys, maybe I wasn't there that day. You guys have screwed this up. You know, you screwed this up in the field or whatever. And then, of course, some of the students got mad at me, and I think they actually went back and checked the data, and I'm the one who actually surveyed that. So, <laughs> <laughs> I so <laughs> and here's another one, just to show you some idea of what you can see with the derived, even derived product, not just the raw point cloud. This is a maize field. So each of these are maize plants, either the stubble on the ground or a laid over maize. And this is right next to where the site is. It's out in the open area. So very high resolution and very accurate when we checked it against GPS surveys, even going out today and finding places, navigating to them, and standing on them with the GPS. You can actually put the LiDAR within the GPS unit and use it like a road map to walk your way through this. The LiDAR a lot, does a lot better than we can actually do with the GPS units in that. And we've actually found things on the LiDAR that we couldn't see by pushing away brush and looking down at it. Okay, so now I'm going to accelerate it just slightly. But one thing that you get, so with the LiDAR, and one thing that was interesting and hard for me to wrap my head around, and, it's, and honestly it's still pretty hard for me to wrap my head around, is that 
you know, this is a cloud of points. You can get in here and walk around. You can put it in a first-person shooting game and walk around. You can do it in this Keck cave, which is sponsored by the Keck Foundation at UC Davis. You can put on these goggles and actually like walk through the touches and stuff, which hopefully we'll be able to do. And apparently what they say at the Keck cave is that you see things doing it that way that you can't see at all. And this is a fundamentally different way of seeing an archaeological site. And what's interesting to me is that um, at the risk of sounding really post-processual, you're able to actually get in there and experience the landscape in a way that's more similar to the way that past peoples probably experienced it. So you can walk down a road and you can see all these connections. You can see blockages and you can see what, what you know, the view sheds from the road and all this crazy stuff that people have talked about but never been able to do before. This is really where the innovation in, um, in theoretical thinking right, uh, is going to come from are these new kinds of connections, this phenomenology of, of these sites, which up until now is a phrase that I would have been really uncomfortable to use, and um, I'm, I'm fine with it now. So what are you looking at here? You're looking at different ways of visualize, visualizing the same feature. And this is a Yakuda. This is a standard issue Parapetra style pyramid. It has a circular element and a square element. Um, and we have one of these at the site. There are some other small ones. We have one really big one, which is fairly exciting. It's just different ways of visualizing that same feature using the, using the LiDAR data. So you here you have what I would consider to be kind of traditional products that I can look at and sort of understand just kind of generally. A hill shape, which shows you a, which is a false two, three-dimensional 2D plus image of that uh, pyramid. And then here is a topographic map, a uh, five centimeter, uh, topographic map, which I'll talk about again in a minute. This is a digital elevation model. All of this is fairly easy for me to understand. This is actually walking through the pyramid. So as you walk through it, you can walk through the profile. You can walk through the center of the pyramid. You can walk into the middle and spin around and look at it. You can walk up the sides and down the sides and move around. This, this is the vegetation that overlies it. This is actually the pyramid down here in blue. You can take that digital elevation model from the LiDAR data and dump it into a 3D modeling program, which is what I've done here. So this is just Google SketchUp. It's now owned by Trimble. It's still free. Anybody can use it. Um, this is what the actual LiDAR data looks like. And this is my architectural reconstruction based on going out and walking around and looking at it. This is really pretty exciting because, you know, for us to do an architectural reconstruction, it's really difficult. It's time consuming. It's expensive. And it also means that we've fundamentally altered the building. We can't go back you know, 100 years from now, if I go back and if I could reconstruct this in 100 years from now, somebody goes back and says, your ideas about how this stuff fit together is completely wrong. And they can't go back and, and redo it and look at what was there. Now we don't even have to do that in the field. We can do it in, in a kind of a virtual way. Um, so what do, we, what do we see at LiDAR? What does LiDAR show us? This is a three-dimensional image of the entire site that you can see here. This is about one square kilometer. Putting a, a scale bar on a three-dimensional image is fairly difficult. This is on Gabuco in its entirety as we understand it now, though it keeps going this way. It keeps going to the north. How far, I don't know. And I'm not going to send anybody up there surveying because it's completely a waste of time without the LiDAR data. Absolute waste of time. Money spent surveying up here would be much better spent with the LiDAR. So how much did the LiDAR cost? $34,000. How, how many field seasons did it save? I can't even begin to tell you. On an academic schedule, you're looking at a decade, maybe more. So what an investment. You know, one, you, you, you pay for something, you, something costs one field season and it saves you 12, 10, 12? How, how could that be expensive? Hey, Chris, can you show us on this image? I mean, I see a, a raised area. Mm -hmm. But what are the features that... So I'll show you, I'll show you some of the things that show that better. But this feature here is that Yaku, circular area, square element. This is about 30 meters by 30 meters or so. Okay? So everything that you see here, all the little bumps, blips, whatever, lines, and all that sort of stuff, those are all architectural features. Everything you see here is the city. The square plaza here, square walls, roads, whatever. I'll show you some other images here in just like one second that are much clearer. Um, and honestly, I could talk about this for the next 20 hours. You know, we could sit here and go through the data and walk through it. Um, and that's another issue with this LiDAR data, is how do we present it? How do we visualize it? How do we present animations? How do we publish animations? There's no way to do any of this yet. 
we're, we're way ahead. We're, we've jumped way ahead of where we are sort of at, in academically in the discipline uh, area. Anyway, there are, 20, there are what I estimate to be 20,000 architectural features up here. Buildings, how, so house mounds, house uh, foundations, plazas, roads, granaries, pyramids. There's several nodes of monumental architecture. There's one here, 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 here. There's one over here, here. All with their own big pyramid complexes. There's ball courts, you name it, it's up here. Um, using the LiDAR derived products in 2011, we were able to document about 4,000 architectural features. In all, at Angamuco, with sub -meter, sub meter accuracy in three dimensions, we have field checked and documented 7,000 architectural features up here. That might be, and I haven't gone through the literature to actually figure this out, and frankly, it's meaningless, but it might be the largest architectural sample uh, from Mesoamerica and maybe the Americas. Why is that meaningless? Because five years from now, this is going to be what people do. There's going to be big sites with even more stuff now. Um, it's completely accelerated our archaeological understanding about the year. Total site area, probably in excess of 12 square kilometers. Uh, several civic ceremonial nodes, reservoirs, earlier, larger, more complex than current models suggest. Not, none of this is supposed to be here. Um, functional and social organization expressed through space. All of the colored area that you see here, so this is, that's a kilometer. This is the, the, the city as we understand it today. All of the colored stuff that you see has, are things that have been field checked in the field, surveyed. So that's, that represents 7,000 architectural features, which is a monumental effort of, by myself, by Steve, and by tons of great graduate students from all over the place. Um, let me take you through one district, which might, might resolve some of these issues. And I'm just going to take you through the district that's just this section right here, just this tiny section. This is what you're looking at. There's that circular pyramid right there. It's on a plaza with two distinct altars in a sunken plaza here. This might be another ball court, but I'm not sure. And I don't know what that is. Uh, there's a, a zone of elite residences up here that are probably priest quarters. Uh, there's definitely a priest quarter here. Uh, there are several distinct entrances to this, including a formal stairway that went up to the top here. Right next to it is a palace, and that palace has its own stairway and entrance. This is a modern wall. It has its own stairway and entrance into this complex, this ceremonial complex here. This uh, palace is walled with a huge room complex uh, back in here, and this little sub patio here, which a couple of the students were calling the dance platform, so now that's called the dance platform, <laughs> just simply because they thought it would be a good place to have a dance. There's no <laughs> So from now on in the archaeological literature, it's going to be known as the dance platform, even though it's completely meaningless. Yeah, sometimes when you have all these students in the field, just things are just out of control. Um, <laughs> this is surrounded, of course, by tons of residential neighborhoods that you see here. So this is one neighborhood, and this is that building that we actually excavated um, last year. This is a formal roadway. It comes through here, another system of roads here. But this all might be a little easier if you see it uh, animated, if this will start. And again, this is the problem with these animations. Is that um, uh, it's probably loading. Well, unfortunately, if this were actually working, what you would see is this would flip up, the vegetation would lift off, and then this thing would rotate around that, that area that I've shown you. Um, but, but this is a great illustration of even the, the normal computers that we have are, are completely inadequate to run a lot of this stuff and to deal with these data. It's how many points it's just on the go on. It's over a million data points, isn't it? I don't know what it is. It's more than a million. Oh, okay. um, and maybe I'll just, I'm going to just skip through some of this uh, stuff right quickly because we're going over time a bit. Um, a palace, but let me show you one other exciting feature that's there. It's a ball court. I shaped the ball court to play the Mexican ball game. First one that's been discovered in the region. 
Again, the poor epic show weren't supposed to have played the ball game, but here it is nonetheless. And here are different ways of visualizing it. The topographic map here, five centimeter topographic map, a hill shade, uh, uh, kind of a digital elevation model, and then a cross section showing you how you can actually walk through uh, these data. And here's that central ceremonial that made note that I showed you different ways of visualizing that main node, and that's actually what the vegetation looks like over it. And I'm just going to accelerate this process. And of course, if you want to learn more about this or see the animations or see hundreds of more images, you can just come talk to Steve or I. Um, and that five centimeter contour, that's what the that's what the yacht actually looks like. Steve is actually standing up there. You can just barely see him. And let me point out one thing. This is a five centimeter contour map, and it's very accurate. So for us to make this map in the field, I'm guessing week and a half, two weeks, with maybe a team of eight people in a total station. Now that includes the time it take, would take to clear it off, because you'd have to clear it off. And as Steve pointed out, just in the act of clearing it off, you're going you're gonna to change and alter it a little bit. You're going to mess it up some. I'm not convinced that after spending that amount of time with all of those people, given my skills of the total station, that I could come up with a map that was as accurate as the slider map. Possibly not. So. It took about 20 minutes to make this, this contour map using, using the LiDAR data and some of the software we have. I can do that for any of the 20,000 architectural features that you see up at Agamuco. Why did it take 20 minutes? Because we don't have fast computers. If we had fast computers, it would take, long, it would take a much shorter period of time. Um, you know, so by the time I load this up, run it, take two bites of my sandwich, have a drink of coffee, and check my email quickly, it's done. Okay, you know, I don't, the time savings is just my you know. Um, current research, while it's accelerated our understanding, completed one uh, field season uh, up at Angamuco, and we expect it to have at least one more, possibly two. Um, and we're completely inundated, not only with LiDAR data, but now with excavation data. Um, from our small excavation season last, uh, well, this year, but the beginning of the year, we have about 33 boxes of of uh, ceramic material along with office boxes that are waiting to be analyzed. It doesn't sound like much, but next year we're going to have 33 boxes. And then the year after that, we're going to have 33 boxes. And then all of a sudden, I really don't know what we're going to do. So possibly stop for a while. <laughs> so anyway, um, that's where we're at. And then let me tell you about the second project very quickly. And that's this project in the Mesquite region of Honduras. Incredibly rugged and dense tropical forest, perhaps the last and most dense tropical forest left in the Americas, and the only place that would buy uh, for that designation would be parts of Amazonia, probably. A great place to test LIDAR, because this is about as dense as the vegetation can cover can get. The Mesquitia is um, largely unexplored. It's a uh, very rugged, very dense forest, completely inaccessible, mostly inaccessible. But it's threatened, and it's threatened by deforestation, by mining, and by oil and gas exploration. And this is actually uh, a, a, a very recent photograph of uh, deforestation that's actually occurring. And it's, it's being deforested also for the, for the old growth timber that's there. Um, it has all sorts of protections, UNESCO protections, a biosphere protection, Honduran protections. But all of it is completely meaningless because they don't have the resources to do anything about any of this deforestation and stuff. And they don't have any baseline data for this. It's impossible to get in there and to, to survey to even make a, an accurate map. They have no data at all for this area. And it is also the location of one of these legendary cities like the city of El Dorado. And supposedly there's this myth that Cortez, in one of his letters back to the king of Spain, mentioned this mysterious province that is in this in the, on the coast of Honduras that contained a golden city uh, made out of uh, uh, white stone, Ciudad Blanca. It's been one of these places where people have gone and looked for it for years. 
and never found it. And probably one of the most famous of these was this guy named Mord, or Morday, who was actually uh, uh, one of the first CIA spies in, uh, in World War II, and he went to this area. Supposedly, he found this city, and he found an avenue lined by giant monkey gods, which is, uh, were actually probably inspired by King Kong, one of the original King Kong movies. He came back to New York and was organizing an ex expedition to go back and, um, and, uh, and find the city, and he was struck by a car in New York City and killed him. And with him went the location of the lost city. <laughs> so people have looked for Miss Ciudad Blanca at, for, for years since then, through exploration, and all of these, so every time they I think that they're almost getting close, the helicopter breaks down. Or the plane gets breaks down, or somebody gets sick, or somebody gets bitten by a giant poisonous hand. A long history of people looking for this. And the most recent of these adventure books actually just came out last year. It's called Jungle Land. Uh, it's kind of an interesting read, where somebody actually went in, along with some other folks, tried to trace the, the uh, journey of Morde uh, and look for um, Ciudad Blanca. And what's interesting to me is this inhospitable terrain that Morde traveled, supposedly to look for Ciudad Blanca, is now deforested and eroded and all sorts of messed up in all sorts of ways. But there's still much of the mesquite that's left untouched. Um, and that brings us to the current uh, project background. Do you want to do this? <laughs> so the project was initiated by a person named Steve Dawkins who formed this Under the LiDAR production group to get funding to go and look for this. He initially tried to use radar. So he purchased some radar, he tried to interpret it. His five meter resolution on the ground got below the canopy, but he couldn't really see it. They couldn't really see anything. Then a couple years later, in, 19, in uh, 2009, 2010, he was reading, he heard about the chases and what they'd done in Belize using LIDAR. And so he went to NCOM, which is a national center for um, laser rate, for laser mapping, airborne laser mapping. And this is Steve Elkins here. And this is NCOM's plane. And he had raised some money, a couple hundred thousand dollars, and had them fly a very large area of the Mesquitia. I think a total of 200 and something square kilometers. Yeah, we've got another slide which has it up there. Nine square kilometers from our window. Yeah, 263 square kilometers. And then they started to interpret it. They also had set up a Global Heritage Foundation to work with the Honduran government and try to raise money to do further work in there. And they actually think they found some things there. That's where Chris comes in and I come in, because then they were criticizing their initial um, exposure of this to the media, saying, you don't have any archaeologists on this. You don't have anybody who really knows what they're looking at. And they'd heard about Chris, or actually read the stuff that um, we published in PDRS, and they approached Chris, and Chris brought me into it to actually take the LiDAR and interpret it. So we've been given access to the LiDAR to start to interpret it. Um, the, an interesting thing is they're a private organization who's funding the acquisition of the LiDAR, the interpretation of the LiDAR, although we've been doing it on, on the side uh, for free um, interpretation and just working with them. And the question that raises, is this a new funding paradigm? You know, this is stuff that no granting agency is going to give the money to do. At least none has so far on this scale. It's too and risky. You can jump in first. It's absolutely too risky for them to fund it, and it's too much money. And, and so this might be one avenue that we have to actually get some of this, to, to get a, a large amounts of, um, large amounts of, of uh, LIDAR data. Uh, and it's one one thing that, and there's some interesting developments in that that are, are starting to happen this year in terms of private individuals and, and private corp and corporations interested in, in funding the acquisition of large amounts of LIDAR, not only for the archaeology, but to provide baseline data for conservation. So we can provide those contour maps, for example, of archaeological features. We can do that for the landscape. And you've got the canopy information, so you have all this environmental data, all this ecological data. It can be used by hydrologists, it can be used by conservation organizations. It's a permanent record of what's there in this area, which is currently untouched, but maybe deforested in the future as mining interests and timber interests go into it. 
Now, there's been some criticism leveled at the fact that a media company is sponsoring this. And we'll address that in a few minutes. But one thing that we thought about as we were brainstorming this today is, this is not the first time that media has jumped in to fund science. You go back to the 1970s, you had Jacques Cousteau, who was funded by National Geographic for National Geographic Specials for media purposes, and did some very good science with that funding. And What's nice about UTL is they're very much interested in the good science. They want to see good science done, and they want to preserve this area. Um, <clears throat> so this brings us to project collaborators. Right. So and I just want to say, I just want to say, just as an aside, um, these these multidisciplinary projects and these big these big great questions that you ask allow you to make all sorts of collaborations that you wouldn't normally be able to make. And one of those, and we've been able to do that both for Angamuco and for the Honduras project. So for Angamuco specifically, we're in the process of creating an MOU, a memorandum of understanding between CSU and the Sorbonne Paris One to do archaeology in West Mexico. I've already signed a formal convention uh, with CSU and the, um, the French laboratories, the French, French government's sponsored laboratories that are based out of Mexico City, which is a fabulous resource for us. We'll be able to use CSU researchers and students are already using the French laboratories in Mexico City and also um, a lot of resources like French vehicles that we'll be able to take out into the field, which incidentally have diplomatic plates, which is kind of interesting. Um, so if we get pulled over, as long as we get, if we get pulled over as long as we stay in the vehicle, we can't get a ticket. <laughs> because technically, as long as we're in the vehicle, we're in France. If we, set, if, we, if we get out of the vehicle, then we can get a ticket. But we can't get a ticket as long as we're in So you can't get arrested. So we can't get arrested. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah. And in Honduras, we signed a memorandum of understanding with the Global Heritage Foundation. That gives us access to the LIDAR to work with it, to publish about it, to investigate it. We've also signed a formal convention between CSU and the Honduran Institute of Archaeology and History, or Anthropology and History. And this allows us in the future to do field work down there. So I was down in Honduras in um, March or February of 2013 work, um, discussing these with the Institute for Anthropology and History. And we signed the convention and now discussing doing field work in November, December, January, or February of this coming season. But, but you, saw, you should also point out, Steve, Steve is actually shaking the hand, hand of President Lobo here of Honduras when, when they're actually signing this um, document. So how, how often do you get to see one of your professors? Yeah, that's, that's actually true. And how often do you get to see leader shake the hand of the president of anybody? You know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so initial results. On to you. I'm just going to do this very quickly because we've already, we're, we've already gone way over kind of. But, um, we, 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 uh, we, they, they, they mapped, they acquired data for three river valleys, three complete regions, uh, which is fairly amazing. I mean, our, traditionally, archaeologically, you're talking about, you know, the time that it would take to survey one of those river valleys would, I mean, that's somebody's career. But that's an open, that's an open vegetation. And this kind of vegetation, <coughs> frankly, I don't know how you'd do it. I mean, it would be, it would be impossible. And some of the big sites that we've discovered, yeah, people are going to go and they're going to check them out. But the hundreds of little sites that we've seen, I doubt anybody's ever going to go. This is going to be the only record of any of these sorts of places. So what was there? Well, exactly what, you know, if you'd ask an archaeologist, exactly what they'd expect to find. Each one of these river valleys is it's dominated by what we would call a very large urban settlement, probably something that I've argued is a city, which, of course, I've been criticized for. Uh, and that's fine. I can deal with that. Um, <laughs> These cities have uh, several, they're, they're characterized by several civic ceremonial nodes, hundreds of house foundation, canals, roads, all the sorts of things that you expect to see in the cities, and then hundreds of, other, hundreds of other smaller places. And basically what you're looking at is a completely transformed human environment with a network of settlements and roads and all the sorts of things that you expect to see um, in this area. Um, and it's really fairly exciting because it demonstrates a number of, uh, it demonstrates some um, uh, number of, of things. And here, here's just a quick, few quick images of some of these features. This isn't actually, this is actually a, a city that, that exists on the edge of this region that was deforested. But it kind of shows you what some of these mounds would look like. Um, and here's some other, you know, very quick images. Um, 
But what this what the, what this actually shows, um, and here's yeah, one of the animations where well, this yeah. was the mosquito animation. So what you're seeing is here's one of those civic ceremonial nodes. There's all the trees, lift off the trees, and there it is. The resolution is not as high as on the Mungo because the vegetation cover is so much denser. I mean, this is really about as dense as you're going to get. What this shows is a completely transformed landscape with dense settlement. Again, in an area where you're not really supposed to see, there really isn't supposed to be this sort of thing. This is on the edge of Mesoamerica. It's outside of the core Maya region. It's not Maya. It's a different cultural group. And because it's so rugged and so remote and the politics, etc., people really haven't explored here. It's fairly exciting. What UTL is going to try to do is they already have permits from the Honduran government, and they're going to go and try to you know, document some of these places. And Steve and I are slated to go on some of these uh, uh, some of these expeditions to check out some of these bigger sites. The only way to get in there is by helicopter. Um, originally, they wanted us to repel out of, a hel out of helicopters, which I absolutely refused no. to do. Uh, so the helicopter has to be it has to be on the ground, uh, and they're trying to figure out how to, to, to accomplish that, and that may happen at any time. Uh, just some other quick images, and again, we can you know, if you're interested in this, come come talk to us, and we can we can show you. But but. Um, just to, to quickly get to some conclusion, conclusions about this work, just because we're kind of running over. Um, Angamuco. The LIDAR data for Angamuco advanced us by probably more than a decade. It advanced us so much, actually, that we're struggling with interpretation. We're struggling to digest and deal with all of this information that we have. It's just simply too much. It completely overturns current models for empire development in the region, which I'm not going to talk about. We can talk about that. Basically, Angamuco is not supposed to be there, and if it's there, what are the implications of that? They're pretty, they're pretty enormous. Um, well, at least for the five people that work there. Uh, there's a federal move to protect the ancient city by, creating a, by making it an official zone, and we'll see where that goes. And one other interesting thing that, for me, is one, one reason that we're trying to get more LIDAR is because now that we've seen Angamuco, We've been to some other places in the Lake Basin. I can tell you that Angamuco isn't alone. There's at least one other big city out there that hasn't been discovered, and there might be a couple more. And, then, and when we get the LiDAR data for those places, that's it. It's, you know, it's going to completely change our thinking about these areas. Um, for the Mesquitia, this project, and we're in the process of publishing these data, is going to jumpstart conservation in the region. We've created a basic database hydrology, topology, the, the ecological zone, the distribution of vegetation, all this sort of stuff that they can start to use for conservation. You can't preserve something unless you know it's there. And in one fell swoop, they, we've given them all this data that shows them what's there for three complete river valleys. It's fairly amazing. Uh, President Lobo immediately after the UTL first announced the data and showed some of the results, uh, designated parts of this area within this already this area that already has all of these UNESCO protections uh, uh, designated archaeological zone or protected zone. Um, UTL has obtained permits and they hope to go back. And the controversy over the project has sparked a lot of interest in LIDAR, a lot of interest in this work, and a lot of interest in the region. And our hope is that by shining a light on this place and its potential we can, we can get money to really start to, to, um, to jumpstart these conservation efforts, essentially. Um, broader implications if we return back to the first slide. Um, if you don't think ancient settlements are there and you don't look, you won't find them. It sounds very simple, but you know, these, these, so this dogma that people have, have held about these areas for Angamuco and for Honduras, et cetera, have, have um, really stagnated the archaeology of these zones. And um, just, in, just in, in, a, in a couple of years, we've been able to really transform people's thinking about, some, at least some people's thinking about, about these places. And, and I think that's um, it's a, little, a little scary that we're able to do that. And it's, I think that that, that that kind of transformation is going gonna, is gonna to become very, very common uh, over the next decade or so as more people begin to use lighter. Um, take risks. Well, we took a lot of risks using the slider. We're still taking risks with the Honduran stuff. We're still pushing the data, and we're getting a lot of criticism for it. Um, hopefully, that uh, hopefully it will it will pay off. We think it already has, but 
Only time will tell. Big, big, big data. Um, this is big data. We haven't mentioned how many returns, how much data is actually there. For the Angamuco stuff, half a billion points were, pro were processed. We're making use of millions of them. For the Mesquitia data, there were 3.2 billion laser pulses that were sent down. 2.5 of those were processed, and there were 4.5 billion returns that had to be interpreted, that are being worked with. Of those, 87 million are those ground points. This is a large volume of data. We're in beyond the gigabytes in this. We need to collaborate with people in computer science. We need to collaborate with engineers. This is truly multidisciplinary. It's not just archaeologists and geographers anymore. We've got to bring in a lot more people to be able to analyze this data, to make use of it. We need better techniques. We need better hardware. We need better software. That's where this we really runs <laughs> Yeah, but that comes with the everything else. You know, but this is really taking us into a whole other area that I don't think geographers that I know of have thought of before. I mean, we've worked with remote sensing for a long time, but not on the scale, not this volume of data. And for me, it's exciting. We need to walk across campus and talk with people in computer science, in management information systems, in engineering. We've got to get them into this type of project. And so it really is multidisciplinary. It's beyond just us as two different disciplines working together, or even bringing in, it's bringing in four or five, six disciplines. Yeah, I think that's it, and I think maybe we'll stop there, and I don't know if we have time for questions. But... We have room until 8. Oh, well, I don't think we're going to stay. I don't know if you want to stay until 8. <laughs>
and you know, learning the big pyramids in Hawaii, but as, as more areas are flown, there people are going to be able to see it. And people can see a pyramid. I mean, it's not it's not rocket science to see a pyramid. I would argue it's rocket science to see some of the other stuff, but the actual pyramid is not. So um, if we don't get if we don't harness this, if we don't get get a handle on this right now, it's going to get out of hand very very quickly. Um, and, and some of these areas are already being destroyed. Right, and then there's the issue of a lot of these areas being threatened, like the areas that were flown. The edges of them are de being deforested. I think that maybe there's less than a decade before that stuff's ruined. Once it gets deforested, it's the, the, the sites are trashed. And so that argument, and then, you know, how can you conserve something? How can you de develop a preservation plan if you don't know something's there? I mean, that's a fundamental goal, figuring out what's there so you can, you know, figure out how to deal with it. So by not looking for these things or not announcing that they're near, there or not publishing these data, people can't go out and do that. So that's, that's Yes. In these grants, are you guys looking at funding stream for maintaining the data over time? And the hard ride last couple of years, the CD rounds in fifty to sixteen That's a really good question. Something I'll answer and then we'll go to So there is that organization called SIR. And SIR, one of the one of SIR's goals. SARC is that organization that wants to, to do all the UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Um, and they want to, they actually want to do more than that. But um, one of their, one of the things that they do, one of their goals is to act as a repository for, for data like that. And we're working, we're talking with them a little bit about putting some of the Angamuco data, uh, of them curating the Angamuco data, and then possibly also some of the Muscogee data, though I'm not, I'm not clear where that ends up. And then that leads us to this, issue of data access, who gets access to it, and they carefully control um, the, the access to that data. But they will, their, their mission is to uh, curate those data in perpetuity, and they have the, they have the um, endowment to be able to do that. But that is a huge issue. And as we get more of these kinds of records, how, you know, how do we curate and how do we store it? And that, sort of stuff. and that could be an area for multidisciplinary collaboration again go to the people who are working at better ways of preserving this data. Because a lot of people need their data preserved. It's not just for things like this. Um, go ahead. I, I, I don't mean to interrupt your flow. You, are you done? Well, well, <laughs> what, you, what you asked is exactly what I said to Chris um, the last couple of days as we were talking about this. It's, you know, this is a preserved for perpetuity into the future so other people can use it. I was like, well, people thought that about photographs. And photographs decay, negatives decay. They're, they're not permanent records. Digital data is not permanent records either. Accidents happen. So we've got to figure out it what's is, the best way to. It's kind of an open this. question that we're grappling with, yeah. but, but we have at least we've thought of it. <laughs> so I have, a, I have a question that speaks probably more to my expertise than to this, but so what? To me, what's interesting is how you would sort out time. So if sites are layers and what you're getting is sort of a, just a, I always say this word wrong, Paul, how do you say it? <laughs> yeah, so if you get this layer of time and you're right. seeing it three-dimensionally, that can only be archaeology that solves those. Exactly. you got to do ground truth. Yeah, you have to do, so, so I, I, this to me is an unbelievable criticism because to me what's interesting about your research is that it's so groundbreaking. It's like, well, now is the time to develop the hypotheses about the archaeology to go and test them. So here's just a question for you because it's so exciting to find this thing that you didn't think was going to be there. So, so a city, like if the size of your city is actually the result of just compressed time, when does it become not so fabulous? So, yeah, so, yeah. There's some, so there's some things to think about. So um, first of all, that, that's why we still do things in there. Um, at Angamuco, so is, was the city constructed in multiple episodes over a long period? And it, Thank and you. It, and, it seems like, and it seems like it was. So uh, at Angamuco, we had we the advantage of we had the advantage of working for two seasons with that architecture and getting a handle on it. So some of the things we didn't talk about in here, and it's something that I really believe that we believe in, is that we need to do a lot of comparative archaeology. And the way to do that is to create typologies and classifications. And so 
we have a very complicated, possibly too complicated, <laughs> uh, architectural typology that we developed that we've plugged into the to these data so that we can classify not every building but a lot. Uh, and it helps us understand them. And some of them we know are later and some are earlier and some, frankly, we don't know about. So when we first got the LiDAR data, I had mostly written another NSF to continue serving continue surveying the rest of the site another maybe four years, three, four years, and then I was going to have to write another one. And as soon as we got the LiDAR data and I sat with it for a week, I was like, what a waste of I've wasted my time. And I scrapped it and we stopped because I realized now with these LiDAR data and what we know, before we do any more other kinds of ground truthing or survey or whatever, we need to know about the architecture and its function and the time to which is the rationale for the excavation. So we can plug that directly into the excavation. Normally, we wouldn't get to that place until we'd surveyed a lot more and understood some of the spatial variation. Now, I think we've got an amazing thing. So it's propelled us into that next thing. So that's what I would say. Is it, does it, and so it, in Honduras, we don't have any of that. There isn't a single peer-reviewed paper that you can find from this case. There's a couple dissertations. There's a couple papers with no peer-reviewed literature. So we don't have any of this background data at all. So for Honduras, you're starting from scratch. And you can use an analogy to some of the architecture looks like, some of the architecture from adjacent regions, and that architecture seems to be dated to you know, certain periods of time. And you can generally say sorts of things about it. I won't put it in people seeing the images of certain things like that. But, but in Honduras, we're starting from scratch. We don't have any of that background data at all. So in that sense, the things that we see in Honduras are completely atemporal. Uh, as far as we know, and that's why we need to go and do a lot more research in some of these places to figure that kind of stuff out. And that is traditional, that's traditional archaeology, or what I would consider to be traditional archaeology. I, I, this is fabulous. Well, thank you. I really appreciate the work, and, and I think what's so interesting to me is it's a kind of storybook cascade of discoveries, innovation, discovery, innovation, discovery, innovation. And at the root of that is risk taking. And I, and I really think it's clear that you have taken risk here. But what the risk that I'm interested in that I didn't hear about was the one from the very beginning. And because theoretically, if it's true that the whole you know, field was really invested in a certain way of looking at sites and a certain expectation of what's there. Your biggest risk was saying, no, I, I, I'm not on board with this set of assumptions. And I, I'd just like to hear more about what were those assumptions in the literature that you actively chose to uh, to deny or, or to just say, to hell with them, I, I believe something else. What, what was that? So, well, I can talk, I can talk about this mostly from Mexico and maybe a little bit from the Mesquitia, although, but for Mexico especially, you know, I work, I've worked in the Lake Costco basically for a long period of time, like since 1992 or something. And, um, actually earlier than that. Uh, and so, I, I was pretty familiar with this model that was derived completely from ethnohistory, with very, very little archaeological testing. So that is early historic records that document the legendary history of the Tarascan Empire and how it came to be. And that history is centered around 12 settlements, known settlements that existed around the lake. And there was conflict during the, during the early and middle post-classic, which is AD 1000 to AD 1350 or so, exactly the period of time when this site dates to. They were small polities, things that we as archaeologists would characterize as middle range societies or chiefdoms. And through conflict and competition over resources, those two, one polity sort of came to be dominant and swallowed those other polities up. And then very quickly that was turned into an empire. And that polity, of course, is where you see the royal dynasty at the time of European contact. And that was in Zunsan, the imperial capital. Okay? I became very disillusioned with that model because there was it was not there was no it wasn't based on any archaeology. All of the archaeology, and, and, and in some respects, it, it was almost like this idea of biblical archaeology, 
where you just you start with the Bible and then you go out and find stuff and then it confirms what you what you expect to see in the Bible, right? And so there's a couple of these really famous historic documents that people have used to derive these models, and they go out and they do a couple small things or whatever, nothing big scale, nothing major, like the things that we're nothing big surveys or anything, and it would confirm what they found in these documents, and it would go back and forth and you'd take models that were derived directly from the documents. And I, I, it just got to the point where it was like, let's just go do some actual archaeology. Let's start from scratch. Let's try to figure this stuff out. And that's why we did that survey. And so based on that model, all of the late post-classic, so post-80, 13, 50, all of the big cities existed then. And those are known places that are talked about. And they're places that have these royal lineages that were present at the time of European contact, 80, 15, 20 or so. For the lake basin, right? Angamuko is not mentioned in any of that ethno-historic literature. Angamuko is not there. It's not mentioned in any of that stuff. So when we started to find this big site here, I was like, look, look we've got a big problem. You know, Angamuko is not supposed to be there. It's not one of the 12 polities that came together. It sounds a little like Balser and Black. It's not one of the 12 polities that came together. It's not mentioned in the ethno-historic documents. It's not there at all. And I think the reason for that, and so when we started to start to figure out how big Angamuko was, everybody was saying, oh, well, it has to be just some place that, it has to all be late post-classic. It has to be this imperial period of time between AD 1350 and AD 1520. Because that's the only time when you had this huge number of people in the lake basin, right? So it must be some forgotten place. And they started to go through the ethno-historic literature and try to cherry pick names to put place and all this sort of crazy stuff. I was like, no. And of course, there isn't much late post classic stuff up there. And I think for the last, I think when the empire was formed, this place and several other places like it came together and coalesced at the big cities that we see at the time of European contact. And they abandoned these places. And I think at the time of European contact, Ankamuko was, some, was, a, was a series of maybe three or four small little hamlets, three or four small places. And their history, and their lineage, and their, all of that stuff was forgotten or incorporated into the myths and the lineages and the ideas that were present at the time of, 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 of the empire. So in that sense, Ankamuko was really a forgotten place. But the story of how it came to be and why those people were convinced, this is my model, I mean, we're testing this. Yeah, it could be wrong. But the story of why those people were convinced to leave that place and probably go to Zunzunsan or maybe Potsgoda or some of these other big cities that existed, that's a really fascinating question. And it doesn't seem, interestingly, to be climatically induced. At least I can't figure out a reason for it to be climatically induced. I think we have to look, it's, I think it's a social process. And I think that it's wrapped up in all of these big changes that are happening in Mesoamerica during this period of time. And in some quarters, that's also a problem. So that's how that piece. Uh, having sadly never had the opportunity to work with the Billy Point Ladder Club, um, <laughs> what kind of tools are available to you to process this, this large amount of data? Uh, you mentioned the, the proprietary Merrick software. Um, you know, I've never seen that on a shelf anywhere. Um, you know, can you uh, can you pull it into ArcGIS and take a look at it? You, uh, no. you, you can pull parts into ArcGIS. Yeah. There's a Arc, the new newest version, I think 10.1, yeah. has a tool for working with LiDAR, right. with point clouds. Sure. But it can't handle something this large. Um, there's Last Tools, which is out there, which can handle something this large, but it's a very, it's not a real user-friendly tool. Sure. And that's only getting the point clouds to where you take and you strip them away and you start interpreting which ones are the actual ground returns. Then moving to identifying these features. Right now what we're doing is we're looking at it in different ways and we're just digitizing on screen. And that's how everybody's doing it. <clears throat> Last year and this past summer, and I want to work on it more this fall, I've been trying to use object-based classification to look at it. So looking at the texture as an input, um, looking, stretching it in different ways to get different color. You should, you should say what that is, I think, really briefly. Object, because people don't know. Oh, object-based 
classification. Usually when you're working with remote sense data, it works with multispectral information. It looks by, goes per pixel, looks at each one of those little grid cells, figures out what is there, and then creates a classification. Right. What object-based classification does is it tries to segment, it takes in the whole image or the whole data set you're working with, segments it, and then looks for unique objects. And you can do this at different scales. So what I've done for this one area, initially, is I've taken it at a fairly um, small scale, so large area, and segmented it, and then taken out a few things. Like I can pull that pyramid out, boom, right away. You know, that comes out as a separate segment, and I can do that for a couple large objects like that. You classify those, then everything that's unclassified, I take it down to another, to a more detailed level segment it again and identify individual objects and then say, so something like this is going to be this type of object. They'll go through and look for all those similar objects and classify them as that. So I'm doing that at different levels to try to automatically then classify as many of the objects as we can so we don't have to go through by hand and digitize them. And then we'll give them the current hardware limitations and how long would that take to um, I, when it's I It's not possible. It's on, an, on another, well, we've got a supercomputer on campus, which I haven't used, but I've been told that might be a place to go and look and see if we can do it. I was told about some people in computer science who had a project where they were trying to identify different types of vehicles and houses and things. So that's, and that's what object-based classification does. There's a commercial software called eCognition, which will do that for you. Envy, which is another remote sensing software, they have an add-on for object-based classification. So does Erdos Imagine has another add-on. So, so there's tools out there, but again, you need the CPU. I mean, when I, I did another, um, so some satellite imagery, which is about 50 centimeter pixels, and I ran an object-based classification on that. It was, I forget how big it was. But I, I basically, I let it run for seven days to, um, Get the classification. So, and let me just say two other things about that. So, okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, let me say two other things about that. So, as we get, as these data sets become more common and we get more of them, yeah. we're not going to be able to go through and do the, the stuff that we're doing with these when these two and two consign time. So, the work that Steve is doing with this classification is really, really important and is necessary to deal with these data sets. And the other thing I want to say about the programs is it's not a unilineal data flow. So, Mars is the Merit software, and we start there and then derive products from that that we dump into ESRI products. Or ECOGNITION e or, or, or ECOGNITION or something like that. But we go back and forth because, you know, for example, you create a DEM and you, there are different questions you have that are guiding the creation of that DEM, meaning that you can create that DEM at different resolutions, right, and for different areas and for different areas. So you constantly have to go back and forth between the point cloud data. Right now, you have to go back and forth between the point cloud data and um, the, the tools like that. And then I dump all of this stuff into either an animation program or an Adobe product to, to, to make the graphics. And hopefully in the future, maybe there'll be something that does all this sort of stuff. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, so yeah. Well, you kind of answered my question in first language. I was wondering if you took a subset of the point cloud data extracted just the building that you were looking at. And could SketchUp take that natively and then work with that point cloud? No, and what it, so, no, and ArcScene also will not take it natively, which is a huge hassle. So I used some, I did a bunch of Googling and I figured out a hack. And I, I hacked my way through a couple of, I think I used two shareware programs okay. to go through different formats and did a bunch of stuff. I can't remember exactly how I did it and I didn't write it down, which is a problem. And then I got it into SketchUp. Now, um, Autodesk, like 3DS and some of those programs, AutoCAD and, and, and 3DS, you, there is a way to export it from ArcScene. So go from, so you have to go from Mars to ArcScene, and then you have to go to ArcScene into uh, a shareware program, and then you can get it into 3DS, and, which is probably a better, you know, 3DS is a much more powerful program, program than um, that no, there is no. It's very complicated. Yeah. Is it possible to do lidar with 
satellite. Yes. There's a satellite up there, I think. Let me just look at your noses. Um, there was one up there called ISAT, or maybe that's a new one, but there was one that was put up, when was it? 2000 something, to measure the elevation of glaciers. So it was originally put up to monitor glacier growth height and also how much was being lost. Um, and it was collecting a point every 100 meters on the ground. So it's not something that we could necessarily use. Now, Professor Michael Lefsky, who's over in Warner College of Natural Resources, he had the, what I think is a brilliant idea of just taking all that data that had been collected. And instead of looking at the ice, because they leave it on when it goes over other areas, he collected it, for, took it for the whole world. All, and then use MODIS data to figure out where all the forested areas were, and then figure out the height of trees in those forested areas. So he came out with a published map of tree canopy height and height of trees, you know, for the whole world, using the data from space. Now there's a new satellite that's going up, and maybe that's the one that's called ISAT. One of them is called ISAT, I can't remember the name of the other one, which will be collecting the same type of data, but with a smaller footprint. And so you'll be able to do the same type of thing on a more detailed level. Um, now what's nice is that since they leave it turned on, you get a year of data, it doesn't follow the exact same track every time, so eventually you build up a lot of information over the whole world. Now, whether that would help us, probably not, because we're looking at things that are 25 centimeter by 25 centimeter on the ground. You know, we want to find walls that are 50 centimeter wide, or less. But, you know, that's what we sort of expect with the Angamuco stuff. So we want to be able to find a half meter wall. Um, we actually were able to do a little bit better than that. But it might help for some other areas. You know, the data that Ohio flew was for one meter. Hawaii's got one meter data for the whole, a point every one meter, basically, for the whole state. So if you collect stuff from space for a long time, now the thing that I didn't, I forgot to mention, is it probably won't help for places like Muskedia. Because one thing that the MCOM people said was one of the reasons they took the project in Muskedia is they didn't know they'd be able to get through the jungle. They said it was so, the forest is so dense there that their research interest in taking the project was to see if the LIDAR would actually shoot through the jungle in those areas. And so they, they experimented with different, um, with different power, basically, to the LIDAR versus return rate, or versus number of shots per meter, per meter, or per area. So because the less shots you take, the more powerful the beam can be going down. But on the other side, you get a return maybe only every couple of meters instead of one every meter or one every 50 centimeters, which is all going to have implications for what you see on the ground. So they flew it, it was like 10 days of flying, and they did some of that at different powers from the, with the unit at different powers. Does that, I went off on a tangent there, sorry. No, I, I just want to say one, one other thing about that. For those students that are out there, those of you that can speak this language and understand these new 2D plus or 3 dimensional ways of seeing the world, are going to have a major step up in the job market. And if you can learn some of these skills, you're going to be highly sought after because this is where these kinds of analyses are going. This is, this is it. This is, this is what we're going to start to do now. It's look at the 2D model is it's done. Everything is going to be 2D plus or, or three dimensions.